Players have dramatically altered the structure of Indian sports, what with IPL setting up new benchmarks. Has single-minded focus on cricket led to crowding out of resources for other sports in India? To take this further, we have this rather nice distinguished panel. Our panelists are Mr. Viren Raskina, former captain Indian hockey team. Currently the CEO of Olympic Gold Quest, which is a non-profit foundation that aims to improve Indian athletes' performance in the Olympic Games. He is the former captain of the Indian hockey team and himself an Olympian. Res represented Indian hockey in more than 180 international matches in a career span of eight years, Viren Raskina. Then we have Mr. Neeraj Bhardwaj, Managing Director, the Carlisle Group. Neeraj Bhardwaj is Managing Director, Carlisle India Advisors Private Limited, which focuses on large growth capital and buyout opportunities across sectors in India. Prior to this, he was MD with Axel Partners and with Apex Partners, initially as a partner in the US, and later MD, country head for Apex in India. He holds an MBA degree from Harvard Business School and graduated with a BS degree in economics from the Wharton School in America, Mr. Neeraj Bhardwaj. And then we have Mr. Randhir Singh, Vice President, Association of National Olympic Committee. Uh, Mr. Randhir Singh is former Olympic level trap and skeet shooter and now sports administrator. He is currently the so sole representative for India on the International Olympic Committee. A 1979 recipient of the Arjuna Award and Raja Ranjit Singh Award. He has been the Secretary General of the I Indian Olympic Association since 1987, Secretary General of Olympic Council of Asia since 1991. He was awarded an honorary D.Lit in sports science from Lakshmibai National Institute of Physical Education and studied at the Yadavindra Public School in Patiala and earned a B.A. in history from St. Stephen's in college. And then we have the lovely Ms. Sonali Chandar, sports editor, NDTV. She's been associated with television news since 1994 and is one of the youngest sports editors in the country also the editorial head of the NDTV Nirmal Marks for Sports campaign, which aims to influence sports policy. She was the face of sports news in India after NDTV became the first news channel to, to start a daily half hour long sports show in 2001. She won the best sports anchor and commentator award at the Hero Honda Indian National Television Awards. May I request you Sonali to take the debate forward? Over to you, thanks. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Just checking if the mic's loud enough. All good. Good afternoon, everybody. It's always interesting to know whether your session's pre-lunch and whether or whether it's post-lunch, because there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Pre-lunch, everybody's already feeling a little rumbly in the tumbly and uh, thinking. So we'll make sure that we stick to time. We won't go any, you know, we won't go over on the discussion because we know that everybody's heading out to lunch after this. Post-lunch is easier because everybody's only just snoozing, but at least they just turn up after their tummies are a little full. Uh, I think those were lengthy and long enough introductions. Um, and you've got you know, all those introductions in front of you, so I can hardly add any more to that. Just like to say, um, uh, just, just to add a little bit to this, uh, I'm going to be very unfair to Viren because he's one of my favorites from the sports world, but he has gone and married a girl from CN and IBM. And I, of course, being from NDTV, am not going to allow him to speak a lot. So, so because there were so many girls in NDTV who were running after him. But anyway, if, in, in case you all want to congratulate him, you can congratulate him, because he's married to one of the finest anchors at CN and IBM. But I am going to be very unfair to him, because he didn't pick an NDTV girl. What can I say about um, Raja Saab over here? He's like, um, you know, I mean, before Lalit Modi happened, uh, you know, maybe, you know, the word Lalit Modi sticks in our mind or whatever and for what he did with cricket and with the IPL. But I think Raja Saab has been far before Lalit Modi. He's been the Lalit Modi or whatever of, of the Indian cricketing scene with every possible role that you can imagine as a former sports person, as an administrator. And why I love him the most is because I had him on a show once with Mr. Sidhu and nobody, nobody in the world can get 
Sherry to be quiet, but he did. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and it was a contentious topic. It was about whether cricket should be included in multidiscipline events like the Commonwealth Games and, and uh, the Olympics. And Sherry had nothing to say. It was just, Maharaja Saab, that's it. I will just lay down on the ground and agree with whatever you say. <laughs> but uh, that was lovely to have him as well. As uh, Neeraj is concerned, I, I, I didn't know him up until today. Uh, and I was, when I found out that he was on our session, I was Googling furiously because, you know, all our sports journalists, we don't know much about, you know, the business world. So I was like, Carlisle Group, Wharton, Harvard, oh my God, you know, what's the Sports Connect? But I come here and I find out that it's the most wonderful Sports Connect, that he's on the board of Olympic Gold Quest, which I knew. But apparently, he is the one who convinced Viren Raskina to not be doing, doing a regular corporate job like his, which involves just about investing $800 million in India, but instead to focus on sports um, after he had chosen the career path of doing an MBA after having uh, played hockey for India as the captain as well. So we owe you a big one for that because Olympic Gold Quest got Viren's um, expertise thanks to Neeraj. And of course, Olympic Gold Quest um, helped produce four of the six uh, medalists. Uh, who won us medals at the London um, Olympics last year. And Viren had a lot to do with that because he was the man there, you know, organizing everything and making sure that those athletes, Gagan Narang, Saina, Merikom, Vijay, could just focus on their Olympics. Um, Neeraj, really good to have you on the panel, even though I had to Google so furiously. <laughs> so, but um, without much ado, I think we want to get started on the topic and um, it's, uh, it, it, it's about the IPL, you know. I think if, if you look at, you know, there's a, there's a big phrase about whether the IPL style leagues are money over matter or whatever. But let's cut to the chase. This is a little bit of IPL bashing. We know it's on. We know we'd love to have tickets. We'd all like to go for a match or whatever. But we want to dissect whether IPL's been good for cricket, which it has, no doubt. But what effect it's had for other sports in terms of whether the franchise model is going to be a success for other sports, because we do know that wrestling, kabaddi, um, golf, boxing, tennis soon to come, everything is going down the franchise route with the name PL associated with it as well. So lots of your questions with some debate as well um, over here. But if I could just begin with, um, in what order do I begin? Age before beauty? Do I begin with? <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Okay, I'll, I'll go with Viren because later I'm going to be unfair to him because of his <laughs> IBN connection. Viren, if I could just get started with you, IPL, good or bad, according to you, or a trailblazer for all other sports as well in India in terms of the franchise model for sports? Um, depending on which way you look at it, I think definitely good in, in, in a large way. Um, it's, it's, it's something that has captured the imagination of uh, the entire Indian public. It's, it's amazing to see for a two-month league, uh, stadiums being full for every single match. Uh, I, I know because I'm, I'm, I'm part of the hockey league, and there are a lot of lessons to learn as to how do you market a sport effectively and, and, and creatively. It, it, it's not an easy task to fill a stadium with 30, 40,000 people for every uh, single match. So in, in that way, there's a lot for the other sports to learn uh, from the IPL. Um, the key thing here, I think, is, is, is making leagues sustainable for uh, the owners, of the, for the franchise owners, for the players, for sponsors. Um, I think what, what really helps cricket is that we have so many superstars. Right. Today in, in, in India, if you look at household names, you, you look at um, uh, uh, role models, the Tendulkar, Yuvraj, Dravid, Ganguly, etc., will be right uh, names on top of your list. Uh, people, people want to come to the stadium to watch superstars. Uh, badminton, we have a Saina Nehwal, but if we have the Indian Open badminton and if a Saina Nehwal loses in the second or third round, uh, pro probably you're going to get much, much more fewer people uh, right. from I'm the gonna, next I'm match onwards. I'm going to interrupt you for a second. There was a time, and I'm sure lots of people will agree with me, when Dhanraj Pillai was in the same league as a Sachin Tendulkar. But what did the Indian Hockey Federation do? Uh, they suspended they dropped six, players. six players of them right after we won our first gold at the Asian Games in what, almost 30 years. 
in, in Bangkok, and they come back and do that. And I remember from the point of view of the media, we rushed to get Dhanraj Pillay on his arrival from Bangkok, and he says, I will never let my son play hockey because this game has treated me so badly. So that's where I'm going to come back to you in a minute. And Rajasthan, I'm going to come to you over here. You can't answer for the Hockey Federation and for certainly for Mr. KPS Gill, who will have to answer himself for why he did that. But the fact of the matter is that has the franchise model that is being adopted by all sports shown up the inadequacies of our national sports federations with not being able to market their sports? No, there's no doubt <coughs> that uh, national federations have not been able to uh, market themselves well. But, uh, but the fact that IPL has come in and uh, the, the franchise, the brand IPL is selling and selling to all the corporate houses and people are interested. The success of uh, IPL cricket has helped the other national federations. And uh, each, most of the federations, as you mentioned earlier, let it be badminton, wrestling, boxing. Everyone wants to have a format which has uh, IPL in it. Mm. Because that IPL name sells. Mm. It, there were so many tournaments, there were so many events, the national federation started, but they couldn't find the sponsorship. But the brand IPL has become such a brand that if you say I have an IPL in wrestling, I have an IPL in badminton or uh, boxing or anything else, it sells on its own. The yeah. name is selling. Uh, the federations, you know, there's been a lot of crit criticism on cricket. Uh, I'm, uh, I enjoy cricket and I play cricket uh, before I start shooting. But uh, cricket marketed itself well. It was an uh, all India radio with the commentary, then the television, and then the way they came up. And then, uh, many people won't like it, but Lalit Modi mm. was a great success. I mean, the way he put uh, the IPL together. Uh, he made IPL what it is. So it's the fact that it's come in, and the fact that it's done so well, everyone wants to be on it. So right. we, shouldn't really, we shouldn't really be uh, thinking that the but National Federation or IPL. You can't say the but National Federation. Uh, it's the same way as BCCI. Now, BCCI is on the bandwagon as far as IPL is concerned. Right. So the federations are making use of the same. But you can't absolve the sports, national sports federations of missing a trick yes. all these years, yes. which is to get corporates involved That's right. in the form of this franchise-based system. And uh, needed Lalit Modi to do it. Needed Lalit Modi. <laughs> And right. I think Sonali, that's putting that's it mildly because for me, uh, being a, uh, a player with the Indian hockey team for eight years, being now sort of in administration in sports, I think uh, we have got the worst people uh, probably who should be looking after national sports federations because uh, marketing wise, having a vision uh, for their sport, absolutely something that is uh, a concept that is alien to them. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, what I, I read in the Economic Times recently a, a, a very fine example how a sponsor benefits from being associated with the IPL. It does not market it, itself. It's, 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 it, it was people that actually uh, created something of, of that stature to make it happen. So, uh, 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 in Indian Simmons, which sponsors the, uh, uh, which is the owner of the, of the Chennai Super Kings, as you know, Indian cements was popular just in Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu. So they wanted to, mar they wanted to market themselves in, in, in the north, more specifically in, in uh, Rajasthan, MP and, and Gujarat. Uh, the idea was good, but the results were poor for quite some time for them. So they, after that, they actually started putting, putting on uh, Koromandel King was the brand. Uh, on the cement bags, they actually put from the house of the Chennai Super Kings. They also dangled carrots to the dealers of free uh, uh, tickets to, uh, to Chennai Super King games. Within three months, um, they, they got around 400 dealers and 10% market share. So, you know, that, that's what an IPL can do. That's what, uh, you know, it, it, it gives sponsors a platform where they can get suitable yeah. returns. We need to create that, that platform where sponsors, franchisee owners find some benefit. Right. Other sports need, need, need to get to that level. No, that's a very interesting example. Neeraj, can I bring you in at this point of time? There is this sense that cricket, good or bad or ugly, and IPL with all its shortcomings, one of which the most obvious one is the huge conflict of interest uh, that is there with Mr. Srinivasan, who owns the Chennai Super Kings and is also the BCCI president. I don't think that would be allowed in the corporate world anywhere, you know? Like, 
husbands and wives can't work in the same company, fathers and sons can't, would this be allowed anywhere in any corporate structure anywhere in the world to have this kind of a scenario where somebody was formulating the rules and is a team owner at the same time? Um, thank you. Firstly, you know, ever since the internet came of age in 95, uh, there have only been five hits on my web page. Those happened in the last week when you were Googling my number. <laughs> I just wanted to give me a new self of confidence in myself. You know, just, maybe just to, to address the broader point you had started out with about cricket. Um, I think the IPL is actually very bad for sports in this country. And the reason I say that is if you, if, as a backdrop, there are very few countries where a new sport emerges to compete with the leading sport. Either countries have had been a two, three sport country for a while, like right. the UK. Uh, but otherwise, you'll be very hard pressed to think of analogies where you had a dominant sport and another sport has come along. Unless it's a new sport, so ultimate fighting, NASCAR, extreme sport. Otherwise, the only exception is China, where you had basketball come along. Correct. So you could argue that China didn't actually have a do dominant sport to begin with. So the reason I say that I think IPL is bad for Indian sports is I think people who are getting into the franchising model and other sports are expecting that they're going to have a success which is equivalent to what had happened in the IPL. And so corporate money going in today is most probably going to get flushed down the drain in new sports. Yeah, and that's an interesting point. My point of view is you first need to develop the idols. You need to have uh, uh, a Saina, a Sanya Mirza, some people like that come along, develop enough high caliber talent, and then once you've attracted the masses, then you get into the franchising model for other sports. Alternatively, you see what happened in South Korea and Japan once they held the, held the World Cup for soccer there that's when football really picked up in popularity. Right now, we put the card before the horse, so most corporates will lose money. And what I worry is that you will then not get that funding later on for other sports. And, and so I think you know, this five years, 10 years down the road would have been great. This at this point in time for other sports is not necessarily the best model. In terms of your, the question you asked me, there is a definite conflict of interest. But you know, um, Indian corporate governance has never really <laughs> been of the highest standard. Right. And I, so I think, you know, with, with, are there, if, if there are enough Chinese walls in terms of how uh, uh, the two separate entities are being managed, I think, it, it, you know, in the ideal situation it shouldn't happen, but if it is happening, right. you need to have enough safeguards in place. Uh, and, you know, frankly, India, you know, is, is, is ranked, I think, in the bottom, bottom quartile in corporate governance globally, so I don't see this as being any different from that. Right. Fair enough. That's just one of the points, I guess, about, uh, you know, something being wrong with the IPL. Yeah. But um, I want to come back to Rajasthan over here. You have some interesting situations on hand as well. Now, do you have a conflict of interest situation going on because you are Olympic Council of Asia member, you're India's representative, you're rather the International Olympic Committee's India representative, and you have been involved with the Indian Olympic Association, which is supposed to be the organization that polices or has an umbrella for all the national uh, sports federations. Now, you've got the situation right now with the sports bill where um, Virain is, is part of this committee as well, which is trying to clean up um, for, for other sports. And you have the situation where perhaps on your recommendation or you know, with the advice you've given that the IOC has actually banned the Indian Olympic Association right now. So currently as things stand, if Saina Nehwal and Mary Com have to take part of the next Olympics, it will be under the Olympic flag and not under the Indian flag. So can you just give us a little bit more on this situation and your role in it? Sonali, let me tell you. First is, why were we suspended? We right. were suspended because there's an Olympic um, uh, charter, which is, the, which is what we go by, the Indian Olympic Association. Then there's a bill, there's a guideline that the government issued. Right. Now, one of our colleagues in the world of sport, uh, Mr. Narendra Batra, he went across and filed a case, which is relevant to hockey, which Virin is aware of, right. and uh, they fought a case, and the court gave a judgment that you have to follow the government guidelines, all the national sports federations have to follow, now, and the Olympic Committee. The court also said that you will hold elections in the Indian Olympic Association with the government code as well as the Olympic Charter, which are totally different from one to the other, which is impossible. So when the elections took place, the trouble took place, and the International Olympic Committee suspended India. Now, as you mentioned about the sports bill, now we have, a, again, the government uh, insisted with the national federations that these follow certain guidelines. Mm. And because we are paying for them, you follow them. Mm. So what happens is you have uh, 
um, uh, people who have to who have, can hold office for three terms, right. or they can they have to retire the age of seventy. On the other side, uh, once that has been accepted by the national federations, and according to the government rules, I think out of 53, 52, 51 have accepted, leaving uh, archery and cricket out of it. Correct. The rest of them have accepted. And archery, now the just for the benefit of all our people over here, archery is headed by Mr. V.K. Malhotra, who's 81 years old yes. and who's been in charge of the federation for 35 years. 41. Now. 41 is it? Oh, is it? But okay, the, the, um, Suraj, the question is, that's all right. Right. Agree, uh, what you said. But the other side is that after this, then again a sports bill is coming. Correct. It's within as a party, as a member of the committee. But I, if you, if you ask me seriously, as far as the Olympic movement is concerned, or the way the world of sport is done today, it's counterproductive. Right. We should, whatever the rules are, whatever you want, you should advise the national federations to amend the constitution and have it incorporated in their constitution. Then right. force it through a bill. And you are infringing on the rights of the people. Is I there a limit? Is there a limit for members of parliament? No. Is right. there a limit for anybody, any other post in any other corporate? No. Right. You, and you want to s limit a tenure in, in the world of sport because you feel 12. As we were discussing earlier, you find that there's younger generation, young CEOs are coming, young presidents are coming in the, in the, in the corporate houses. Now, if you have a person who is a shooting president, and shooting is the number one sport today, becomes a president at the age of 30, by the time he's 42, 12 years, he's out. Right. Now, who in the world of sport will give you any recognition or any, India, India will go unrepresented <coughs> in the world of sport. Right. At the age of 42, you throw the president out. Why? Because your sports bill is there. No, I understand. I, mean, no I, logic. I, know, I know we may be digressing just a little bit, but there is a point to all of this. I'm going to get Viren to yeah. respond to some of what you're saying because he's a little bit on the opposite side from you over here. He's a sportsman. He's a sports person and he's on this new um, working group that has been asked to redraft the sports bill. And the whole purpose, Viren, of the sports bill was um, uh, whatever you may read between the lines, whether it was to rein in certain politicians or whatever, but the fact of the matter was that the sports bill was, in, in most views, was an attempt to cleanse Indian sports. So, but, but interestingly, the whole, the reason why the sports bill even went for a redraft is because cricket refused to have anything to do with it. They said, there's no way you're going to RTI us and find out how much a secretary of the BCCI has spent traveling in one year or anything like that. But the bottom line is, that I'm trying to say, is that when a sponsor looks at sports, all sports in India vis-a-vis -vis cricket, they see a big mess in Indian sports. A mess that we are seeing right now with Vijinder Singh, even though it might be a personal issue with regard to whether he did, you know, has tested positive for heroin or not, whether it is the suspension of India from the Olympics with coming months after we had our best showing at the Olympics, whether it is our dope cases, our girls from the Commonwealth Games, uh, you know, failing dope tests. From the point of view of the sponsor, they see a mess for other sports, don't they? Absolutely. I think, uh, Sonali, uh, I, I, the, I am part of the committee that is helping to redraft the sports bill. Uh, right at the outset, uh, probably I just need to ma uh, make it, it's, it's currently under discussion and as per uh, right now, until we actually formulate the bill, only the, chair, the, the chairperson of the committee, who's uh, Justice Mukil uh, Mudgal, who's the former Chief Justice of the uh, uh, Punjab and Haryana uh, High Court, on, only he's supposed to publicly speak about it. But I just want to say that right from the start, uh, it, it is very clear that the sports bill is not meant to interfere with the autonomy of any national sports federation. Right, right at the outset, the preamble of the bill is going to follow everything that is as per IOC norms, which is the International Olympic Committee norms. There will not be anything, whether you look at good governance, whether you look at ethics, in any way that is going to be in conflict with the norms of the uh, IOC charter. What is very important is to ensure that the perception of the bill, not the perception, the reality of the bill is that it will support sports and it will support sports persons. Mm -hmm. Even our only individual Olympic gold medalist Abhinav Bindra is on the committee. Right. As uh, Randeep sir said himself, I am a sports person first and fo foremost. For me, the most important thing is that the athletes at the ground level 
they benefit for far too long whatever we do in sports whatever the government gives money to most of the national sports sports federations that's the reality take away the bcci no federation in this country has the caliber to raise sponsorship on 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 their own right so when you are getting government government funds you have to be accountable there has to be uh, 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 there has to be proper transparency and accountability as to how the funds are utilized. We have to ensure that there's no sexual exploitation in camps. We have to ensure that our players uh, are educated about doping. The kid at the ground level in sports, a kid who's playing archery or a kid who's playing boxing, he might be coming from a rem remote village in, 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 in Haryana or Punjab. If the coach tells him, Beta, ye, ye medicine lena, uh, tera strength ke liye acha hoga. In our culture, we follow what the coach tells us. There's no education for the kid at the ground level. And if he's caught in a dope test, he, he's going to suffer, he's going to be punished. So the sports bill is going to ensure that our athletes get the right education, that they are well protected. Right. And I think it's, it's, it's totally wrong if we create this perception in the press that it's a draconian bill, that it's against someone, it's against no one. Right. We're just going to try to ensure that ethics, good governance wise, administratively we are strong and we help the federation we are on the same side at Absolutely. the end of the day all of us want indian sport to benefit all of us want india to do well at the olympics we are not here to be in conflict with anyone yeah, yeah. we want to take everyone yes. along and, and and make the best possible bill see Viren, you you we are part of the same family so but if you look at it carefully the government of india gives you money to train the indian athletes correct the the impression goes around that the national federations are receiving the money. The national federations do not receive the money to, to train your athletes. Your athletes, the money is allotted in the name of hockey, but the money goes for training to the Sports Authority of India. What is Sports Authority of India? It's part of the government. So the money in your name goes to the Sports Authority of India. If your athletes are under doping, the NADA is run by the government of India. Okay? And the Sports Authority coaches are the people who are you, as you said, the coaches are responsible for giving the children uh, the drugs. Who is again responsible? It's directly under the sports authority. Mm -hmm. So you should ask the sports authority or wherever the coach is, either they're paid by the state governments. There are no private coaches as such in our country. They're either paid by the state sports departments or they're no, paid I, by the I, sports I, authority. I take your point, Mr. Andhiri Singh. We may not know the details of yes, how this works yes. out and we want to make the national sports federations into the bad guys. Correct. But just the one point that we are trying to dwell on that you know, why is it that the other sports have not been able to seize on the various opportunities that may have come their way with regard to bad governance? The point that Viren is saying is that the bill is a good thing. Why does the IOC believe that this is interference? If there is, because the broadly, the large parts of the bill are that there should be tenure uh, caps, there should be age caps, which are like going up all the way to 70, and that there should be former sports people who are involved with sports. What's so objectionable see, with that? See, Sonali, the problem is that the sportsmen are not getting into national federations. And there are very few who are involved in it. And some of them, like some colleagues of ours who got into sports federations, left because they, didn't, they couldn't work in the system yeah. of the national federation. They weren't it's politicians. It's enough. not that the national federations are absolutely clean. On the other side, Every national federation, all the funding that's coming from the government of India, the national sports federations are audited by the CAG. Right. They have an RTI. This is not, I'm not talking about cricket, but it's being followed. There's an RTI, there's CAG. Every federation is supposed to have the ethics commission. You are supposed to have an under the National Olympic Committee, an arbitration commission, which we have. Now, question is, is it working or not working? Right. Is the, the commissions are there? The commissions are, as per the International Olympic Committee rules and regulation, are there. What we have to do, instead of putting bills and you know, trying to control sports, there's no, there's no question that uh, you find one bureaucrat or the other bureaucrat, one right. chap is better than the other. It's not necessary. Right. I would rather have Viren as a president of the Hockey Federation than find a bureaucrat who suddenly lands up and becomes president of the Hockey Federation. It's, right. it's the purpose is defeated. Mm -hmm. Now he at his age becomes president 12 years, he's out of hockey. What will be India's image? You started hockey, you were the center for hockey in the world, but you were badly represented in the world body. Right. Remember this. And you were badly represented, today you're playing hockey on this astro surf, astro uh, uh, turf, and you have no say. Right. So how does it happen? 
you have to be in the world bodies. Mm -hmm. If you're going to start having restrictions on term, you're going to have restrictions. Who is going to represent India in the world bodies? So Nobody. by the way, your being our IOC representative or the IOC representative for India means you can help us make sure wrestling doesn't get kicked out of the Olympics? No, no, we obviously the International Olympic <laughs> Committee is very keen that India should have the National Olympic Committee. Everything should be in place. The IOC has invited the Indian Olympic Association right. as well as the government of India to come sit together and work it out. So it's not something that can't be sorted out. It's right. something very simple. Right. It's not difficult at all. It's, Fair it's, it's, it's Fair just enough, a question of understanding. The reason I brought up the wrestling example is because that's another case of where we may be losing our yes. Olympic medals if it is thrown out of the Olympics. Neeraj, if I could just please get you in at this stage because we may have digressed just a little bit. Is the fact of the matter that IPL, with all its shortcomings, whatever it may be, is still the obvious choice for all sponsors, perhaps most of them, unless you happen to be a hero, who have taken a conscious decision to not be part of uh, the IPL with regard to either owning a team or sponsoring a team, but have chosen to invest in uh, the Hockey India League. Mm -hmm. But for other sponsors, do you think that that you know, that option is not there because of good governance from other sports, that they have to wait for a franchise model before they can enter hockey, cricket, uh, hockey, boxing, uh, golf, etc. You know, I, I mean, <clears throat> I, if, if I'm, you know, I'm on the board of public companies or, or private companies, right, I would be encouraging them to put money in the IPL because I see the return on investment there. Unless you make a decision like Hero has done here where they're willing to promote a sport, not necessarily for the financial gain they see in there, but from a longer term perspective of sport development. I think that's where you will see um, uh, uh, you know, for money of getting to other sports, but that'll be few and far between. I mean, Viren and I, as you mentioned earlier, I'm on the board of Olympic Gold Press. We have a tough time uh, raising money, you know, even where people are, to fund specific athletes, right? Where you're willing to give people branding. There's no financial return. But that's tough because sort of the mentality of giving towards sports is not there in this country. The mentality generally of giving is not there. Right. Uh, and so with the IPL, at least what you've got is, you know, it proves a, a financial model, but you don't see that return on investment in other sports. And you, I, I mean, anyone who says that it, you see the, re, you know, there's a return on investment in wrestling, badminton, it's a joke. There's not Correct. enough quality players there to create, to capture audience in, interest. You don't have the stadiums, you don't have the entertainment. That's where the money is made. Right. right. It's just not, you can't just make, I mean, idealistically, yes, people should promote hockey and badminton, but they don't see the return on investment. Why should they do it? Right. It's interesting. I mean, I, I read in the paper the other day that Washington Apple, which costs 150 rupees a kilo, have tied up with Delhi Daredevils to be their official fruit. So that's how desperate corporates can be to get involved with the IPL or the cricket bandwagon. Yeah. Any which way will do. Official chewing gum, official fruit. What could we have next? Official under linen? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure there are immense prospects. But questions, um, you know, while we carry on over here, anybody, if you can raise your hand, we'd be happy to. Yeah, I see this gentleman, 12 o'clock from me, who's been the first off the block, so you get your chance as well. Uh, yeah, we all are criticizing the BCCI, but in the panelist's opinion, what has the BCCI done right that cricket is the largest sport in India compared to other sports? I'll give that to. What's that? What has what, what is the BCCI done right? BCCI? Done, done right. By having the IP. By having. No, in, in general, to the IPL and to have its See, valuations. If you, if you study BCCI over the years, the way it was formed, the way it started, and from test cricket, then going into 50 over matches and now to T20, it's they marketed themselves much better than many other federations have done it. And then cricket has been a popular sport in our country. So I won't say that BCCI would be the best run federation. There may be other federations in the country who are better run or as well run. But the question is, is money available like like uh, um, Mr. Bhadwaj mentioned that are we today interested in giving money to a certain sport, though the sport may be well run, may be well, uh, uh, you may be winning medals internationally, but does it have the viewer capacity? But we, BCCI definitely has uh, managed it and cricket is a popular sport and IPL has helped you. And the way IPL has been put together, that's raised all the money and funds for the players and once the players are happy the world is happy around so people as uh, business houses are, are investing in uh, cricket so i don't know what if that's your question i've answered your question right or wrong yeah but while we take more questions i'd also like to ask mr munjal because wh just while you were missing we were talking about the desperation that corporates have to get involved with cricket at any cost and how washington red apples have associated with the delhi daredevils team because nobody wants to lose an opportunity but 
you would be perhaps the best example to give of why heroes stayed away from owning a team and now even sponsoring a team as you used to do with Delhi and, and with Mumbai to taking a conscious decision to go into hockey which is having its third innings with trying to have a, a, a league system in India. Not working? That was the mic we were supposed to give to Virin. <laughs> uh, one of the reasons companies choose to get involved with cricket is, is pretty obvious. That it is the largest watched sport in this nation. It's not just the largest watched sport. There are people who kind of uh, almost identify themselves with different players or different geographies, different stadia or different teams. And which is wonderful by the way. And and as, as uh, Ranjit just said, once IPL came in, that got even sharper definition and which drove larger support, larger money, and it's, it's a virtuous cycle. And we chose to back out, uh, well, in, we didn't quite back out in the sense, we chose to, to diversify because there are other sports which were getting uh, very low or no attention at all. Mm. And as you know, we've done this earlier as well uh, as, as a group looking at things like golf, which were not getting a lot of attention in those days. Commonwealth then, Games. Then recently, yes, in the Commonwealth Games. And, and I'm not sure if, I'm, if I have the exact information, but I'm told we were one of the, probably the only companies who chose not to threaten to walk off when all the noise started getting made about the Commonwealth Games because our, our idea is to support the sport itself. Right. And, and uh, not any individual or, or the administration, but the sport. And which is why we, we as, a, as a group, have focused on uh, hockey now, because that's our national sport and getting very, very little attention. So uh, I think the reasons are fairly obvious. And, and the point of not uh, opting for a team was because we were not comfortable ourselves getting directly involved uh, up front, it is to stay at the back and, and uh, support the, that specific uh, sport itself by just being sponsors. Right. So Rari may add to what he said. Right. Their company, I've been watching, not the friends of mine, but over the years, they have their interest is sport, which is not, as uh, Neeraj has mentioned, it's not, you know, you have to look at it as a corporate, look at it as a, a, what's the return you're getting as business. They don't do it for a return. Mm. I remember his brother coming into the Commonwealth. I was also in the Commonwealth. So he's sitting with me. I told him, I said, why are you getting stuck in this? So he said, no, I'm giving, spending this money on the torch relay as far as uh, the community games are concerned because it's our commitment to sport. Right. I mean, that's a diff if you have that attitude, it helps so much. The same they did for golf. Nation yeah, nation right. sports. And that's, that was for sp uh, golf, and now they come into hockey. Right. So I think it's, it's well, an attitude. Like it's a an round attitude. Of, a round of applause because it wouldn't be possible without without the support of the sponsors for, for other sports to flourish in, in this country and certainly not for hockey. So not, uh, for, for me, one of the lessons from the leagues in other sports which for, which for me to, to witness was really interesting was uh, the, the regional aspect because uh, the Hockey India League that was recently held, matches in Bombay or Delhi were the only two stadiums which were not houseful. Right. But if you go to the smaller towns, for example, um, the semis and finals were in Ranchi and actually it was something to be seen to be witnessed because there were lines snaking outside the stadium which were over a kilometer long. There were people sitting on the trees outside the stadium watching the hockey final. There were people on the, lined up on the terraces outside watching the final. So uh, it's, it's the smaller town that has played for the Indian team. In, in all across the country and when we played in, a, a, in an Amritsar or Patiala or, or, or the smaller towns, you could ensure yeah. full, full, full stadiums, but not so in Bombay or Delhi. Yeah. Well, as, but as in, I just wanted to say Sorry. that little, some small marketing uh, gimmicks also work. As he was mentioning, those, uh, the team that bought the Ranchi Rhinos didn't plug their name very consciously, but one thing that did stick out for somebody like me who didn't watch a lot of the matches is Ranchi Rhinos came up with a little, um, uh, you know, with a, with a little symbol that this is, this is what, you know, the Rhinos were. So, and I mean, I had my son running around doing that every time he scored any kind of goal, football or otherwise. But those are nice things to do, you know, uh, which, which 
those little things because of course the, the love for sport that, that brings a sponsor to the game or whatever is important. But and Sonali, from what Neeraj said, I actually spoke uh, the, the owner of the Ranchi Rhinos in the Hockey India League, it was the Patel Uni XL group and exactly what Neeraj said that for them they were not looking at the returns instantly. Yes, uh, if, if you looked at the Ranchi Rhinos stadium, everywhere the branding was only Ranchi Rhinos, it was not Patel Uni XL group. Right. And I actually asked the owner, oh, why aren't you putting your company name, you are the sponsors, you are the team owners. So he, he said for the first two or three years, we are only looking at build, building the, the Ranchi Rhinos brand, we are looking at build, building goodwill and, and, and then from there on see whether it becomes, uh, uh, we can convert it into a, in, into a very robust marketing initiative. Right, right. But Neeraj, just to, you know, as, as we almost close out the session, even cricket needed its help with IPL. I mean, I've attended in the first season in the IPL, I attended a match in Calcutta when Shah Rukh Khan didn't come and the stadium was empty, you know. So it was not, and, and in the first two seasons, apparently Kolkata Knight Riders, the only branded t-shirt that they were selling through their stores was Khan 12. It was not Saurav Ganguly, or it was not whoever they had at that time, certainly not John Buchanan or whoever who threw out Saurav Ganguly, but the first two years, the only t-shirt they sold was Khan 12 for a cricket team and for a cricket area that loves its cricket. So, you know, even cricket needed the Bollywood appeal, needed all that Mitch Masala to come in before people, you know, went for the cricket no, as no, well. I, don't get me wrong, I think what the, uh, what the IPL did is, it, it's, it's, if you look at the NBA franchise in the US, they don't make money because it's the sports team, it's because they've married sports and entertainment. Right. right. The money is made in merchandising, the money is made you know, on food sales, right? That's where you make money. And I think at least for cricket, IPL has proved that model in India. So I think that is a great start. But as, as uh, Mr. Singh was saying, that's built on the popularity of cricket in India. I don't think the other sports are there right now. So to assume that in a short time frame you'll get hockey or badminton, potentially golf will get there. I think golf maybe has, has uh, enough Indian stars in there. But for the other sports, there's going to be a gestation period where I'd rather those dollars Either, you know, as if people are willing to make that long-term investment, that's fine, but I'd rather they give that money towards individual athletes, to promoting a basketball star who can actually get an NCAA scholarship to the U.S. and then, then get into an NBA team. So this is a 20-year game. You know, if you, look at, if you look at basketball in China, which I say 300 million people play, it started when the Washington Wizards went there in 1978. And then now 30 years later, you have 300 million people playing. In India, you know, it's just not going to happen that quickly. So I'd rather yeah. the money get diverted where you're, you know, to the development of the sport uh, versus the branding of the sport today. I think we're just at a different uh, stage in the evolution of the other sports. Cricket was at a different stage. Right. But what has, the IPL has done is it's got entertainment to sports. I mean, I went to a lot of the World Cup cricket matches, and when you go and watch cricket in India, it's like going to, you feel like after you come out of the game, you've gone through a hostage crisis. Right? You're exhausted, you've stood in line for two hours, there's no water, right? I mean, that whole needs to change. It needs to be fun to go and watch the sport. It's all about entertainment, not the skill-based aspect of it. Right. That's true, because I think as we close this session, the fact is that... Um, we aspire to be a great sports nation, but within, we do need a sports culture as well. We need more people going out there and, and playing a game rather than actually just watching. And, and yeah, as Neerud said, sports and entertainment, it's, it's a great marriage. Make sure you can go and have fun for three hours at the match. And by the way, I've never seen more people at an IPL match who are more interested in the food and drink and less interested in the cricket. <laughs> but it, it, it happens. It is a new audience that has come to cricket. There are women who watched only for Mandira Bedi's blouses. <laughs> there are people who watch only because, you know, they want to hear uh, Sidhu's commentary. But I have never seen that many people interested in cricket who actually don't want to do the cricket, but like everything along with it. But that's still a lesson learned, perhaps, for, for other sports as well. Absolutely. You know, uh, that sometimes, you know, if, if people want to go see a Saina Nehval, they might appreciate her a lot, admire her a lot, but they'd still want to have a good stadium experience uh, when they go over there. Just, just a closing thought for you, uh, Virain, with regard to the IPL uh, and what other leagues can learn from it? I think it's, uh, for me, the, the key that other, thing, uh, that other uh, leagues need to learn is sustainability of, of, of the league. We just need to go with a much long-term uh, vision. Uh, very important is, is getting a window in the year to ensure that all the top athletes from India as well as from the world come over here and play the league because without that, which means good relations with the National Federation. Without that, we're not going to be able to attract the sponsors. We're not going to attract the eyeballs. So that's a, a, a key part. And, and uh, I think the league's mushrooming all over the place. But we need to just think about more carefully uh, about the sustainability of right. a league and not just a one-off. And thing. as 
And as Neeraj said over here, they're not for corporates to rush in thinking yeah. if I missed out on the IPL bandwagon, yeah. I can get on to hockey and hope to get the same return. So they need to tread with caution yeah, sure. as well. And either go as, as, as the Munjal family does with your love for sport, which can never be wrong. Uh, but you know, the return on investment will come later. But uh, Rajasab, just to get a closing view from you, will it be a good thing if we have a very successful wrestling Premier League that is due to come right now and at the same time perhaps lose wrestling from the Olympics and therefore the prospect of India winning medals that way? I think um, I have a feeling that wrestling has a worldwide sport. And uh, the International Olympic Committee in the session, firstly, we have an executive board meeting in May, May in St. So Pittsburgh. there's still hope. So I have, there's hope that it will be shortlisted. And then once it goes across to the General Assembly in, Spain, in uh, Argentina in September, I, have, I personally feel we have a very good chance that wrestling will be back. And on the other side, as far as the IPL is concerned, wrestling is very popular. Though it's in certain areas, it's a mm. uh, sport in our country. Uh, is in certain areas. You do have uh, boxing in certain areas, wrestling, all over. I mean, even on our event and shooting, there's uh, in the east there are rifle shooters, west there are pistol shooters, in the north they shoot shotguns, the shooters are more popular. So like that, there are pockets there. And in those pockets, this uh, sport will definitely, wrestling will do very well. Right. So as Neeraj said, the PLs are here to stay, whether it's the wrestling Premier League, tennis Premier League or whatever. and and may the sponsors all get their return on investment in some way or another. We are just about done here, but any one last question? Anybody that I may have missed out? I know we've got Nippon. Anybody else with any other closing thoughts for our panelists? No, everybody's in a rush to get to lunch. So am I, so am I. <laughs> so thank you so much, and I hope you enjoyed that discussion as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. And, uh, um, and, and thanks for being with us. Thanks, Sonali, for conducting that rather beautifully. That was uh, our session on India's new sports leagues. May I request Honorable Group Chairman to please come up and uh, to give away the mementos to our panelists. First, Mr. Neeraj Bhardwaj, Mr. Randhir Singh, Mr. Viren Raskina, and to our moderator, Sonali Chandra. Thank you very much, each one of you, for being here and being part of the Mind Mind Summit 2013.